I'm really excited to introduce um, Chloe Joris, who's an associate professor at the University of Puerto Rico Law School. Um, and there she combines her training in law um, and uh, cultural studies and art um, uh, to look at complex intersections of technology with gender, colonial, and racial histories, cultural memory, and art. In addition to teaching, she directs the Clinic on New Technologies, Intellectual Property, and Society, and co-directs Creative Commons Puerto Rico. She's an active member of the seminar in Latin, American, in Latin America on Constitutional and Political Theory, an annual academic gathering partially funded by Yale University that brings together scholars from Latin America, the Caribbean, Europe, and the United States. She's also a member of the Red Latin America de Academics del Derecho, which is the best Spanish I can muster, I apologize, <laughs> a network of law professors funded by the Ford Foundation and American University Washington College of Law, among others, to promote the transformation of legal education in Latin America from the perspective of gender and sexuality studies. She collaborates on two Canadian SSHRC-funded partnership grants, the first centered at the University of Ottawa called the Equality Project with Professor Jean Bailey, who's here with us, uh, which is focused on better understanding whether and if uh, and how big data, practices, uh, big data practices affect the privacy and equality of young people from marginalized communities, and two, the second centered at McGill University that focuses on, uh, focuses on addressing rape culture at university campuses. She's also, uh, in 2018, our first uh, international visiting scholar. Uh, she's here under the auspices of the Greenberg Chair. In her creative endeavors, she combines her multilingual literary writings with visual artworks. She's published and presented her creative work in Puerto Rico and abroad, and she's the author of the book, Rediviva, Lost in Trance, My Lations, editorial, uh, in two, which was published in 2001 and which was distinguished by the Puerto Rico Pen Club. Um, we're very excited to have uh, Professor Juris with us. She's also been here uh, through the January term, and she's studied here at the University of Ottawa um, with our law technology program. That's where her LLM is from. Um, I just wanted to say briefly that as the title indicates and as was advertised, this is about sexually explicit resistance art. Um, so this presentation includes depictions of, uh, of nudity and sexuality. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joyce. So uh, thank you uh, very much for all of you uh, for being here. Um, it's hard to express my profound gratitude to Ottawa University for all the support it has given to my academic career since at least 2008. In terms of my current collaborations, I want to specifically thank my friends and colleagues, Jane Bailey and Valerie Steves, for inviting me to collaborate uh, in the Equality Project. Angela Cameron for uh, supporting me via the Shirley Greenberg Project, and interim dean at the time, Francois Larocque, for helping uh, the collaboration come to fruition uh, come to fruition. Sarah Heath, who was indispensable in the preparation for all the applications and other documents, and many others. Um, at the time, we had no idea uh, what awaited Puerto Rico in the forthcoming months, namely Hurricane Maria. All I can say is that I was and am very moved by the deep humanity of my colleagues here and their understanding of the challenges we face in the aftermath of the hurricane, but even more pressingly in its combination with the shock doctrine of disaster capitalism. So thank you to all for continuing to strengthen the ties between our institutions. In terms of the text I will be sharing, it is very, 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 very much a draft a work in progress. I'm afraid that I not only experienced the hurricane, but that I have an enduring case of what I will call hurricane brain. Furthermore, at such an early stage of writing as this one, I am generally not sure I agree with all the ideas I propose and will be grateful for your input on how to improve the work. Uh, the original presentation, title of my presentation as announced was the one uh, you see here. However, uh, in the process of uh, investigating and writing on the topic, it recently changed to the following title, From Sexual Explicitness to Invisibility in Resistance Art, Coloniality, Rape Culture, and Technology. In this text, I explore the dilemmas posed by sexually explicit resistance art and anti-surveillance art in the context of debates on post-colonialism, rape culture, and new technologies. 
feminist performance artists making sexually explicit works that question the ubiquity and acceptance of sexual and gender violence is not new, as we shall see, but the integration of new technologies, social media, and the internet to these artistic interventions raise novel questions regarding the intersectional phenomenon of rape culture, the deployment of the male gaze, or its post-colonial incarnation in what I will call the technocoloniality of vision. For purposes of my discussion on sexually explicit art, I will focus on the work of Emma Solkowicz. I think that's how you pronounce her, her name. Emma Solkowicz defines herself as a person of mixed race that has knowledge of being a woman and a victim of sexual assault. She became widely known for her 2014 mattress performance, Carry That Weight, an endurance performance piece inspired by her experience of having been raped by a fellow student and friend that Columbia University officials later failed to expel. Her artwork addressed that injustice by acquiring a dorm mattress on campus at all times for almost a year, becoming an effective form of institutional critique and political art. Quote, the simplicity of her gesture in comparison to the normity of its subject hit a chord with college students across the country, as well as with the public at large and the media. She became an eloquent spokesperson for enduring sexual assault on college campuses and for reform regarding how colleges address sexual assault when it occurs, end quote. After her story reached the mainstream media, many accused her of seeking attention through her false claims. She became a target of attention of the manosphere. A loosened network of groups that believe men are an oppressed class began a deplorable campaign that viciously harassed Emma, spewing misogynist and racist myths too vile to repeat, and demanded that the university shut down her performance. This background is important to contextualize her sexually explicit work, Ceci n'est pas un viol, this is not a rape. Released in June 2015, the work consists of a website hosting an eight minute video, an introductory text, and an open comment section, which as of this weekend had 5,413 posts. The video, directed by Ted Lawson, shows Emma having sex with an anonymous actor in a dorm room at Columbia University and shows the shift from consensual to non-consensual sex, ending with what appears to be anal sex. Shortly after it appeared, the video was taken offline by a denial of service attacks, but is currently available at www.sustainiepasanviol.com. Before uh, entry into my analysis of Emma's work, I will do some theoretical groundwork to lay the foundations of my discussion of her performance and my later comparison to anti-surveillance artworks. Although the emergence of the term rape culture as a concept uh, is fairly recent, a, a fairly recent historical phenomenon, it has become a broad political, theoretical, and metaphorical umbrella for debates on feminism, patriarchy, technology, and visual culture that are central to my analysis of sexually explicit and anti-surveillance art. Defining rape culture as a thorny process given the complexity of the topic, multidisciplinary approaches, and transcultural specificities that can be brought to bear in the process. However, the most widely accepted definition of the term, which has become a template for much research, was provided by Emily Bushwald. I'm not sure that's how you pronounce her name. Rape culture is, and I quote, a complex of beliefs that encourages male sexual aggression and supports violence against women. It occurs in a society where violence is seen as sexy and sexuality as violent. In a rape culture, women perceive a continuum of threatened violence that ranges from sexual remarks to sexual touching to rape itself. A rape culture condones physical and emotional terrorism against women as the norm." End quote. Rape culture has to do with social discourses and practice that accept, allow, minimize, and normalize sexual violence against women through social institutions, communities, and individuals. Contrary to places where rape has been openly advocated, the notion of rape culture names an insidious seemingly passive societal discourse that rears its head in more subtle ways like victim blaming, criminal leniency, and a general lack of knowledge about the real pervasiveness of sexual assault and its consequences. 
The term rape culture is deliberately provocative given how it brings to light the passive, subconscious, underlying, and underhanded way it advocates for permissibility and dismissal of sexual violence. Excuse me. So let's turn to the relationship of rape culture to visual culture. Okay. So studies on visual culture and feminism have come together in powerful ways to reconfigure debates on the intersection of visuality with multiple forms of domination. Visual culture is a mode of critical visual analysis that questions disciplinary limitations, in particular those posed by art historical analysis, that has historically insisted on the sharp distinction between high from low cultural forms. Thinkers of visual culture who speak of the visual construction of the social rather than the often mentioned notion of the social construction of the visual focus on the centrality of vision and the visual world in constructing meanings, maintaining aesthetic values, and racialized classed and gendered stereotypes in society steeped in digital technologies of surveillance and marketing. Visual culture is a counter-hegemonic tactic for, quote, those who do not control the dominant means of production to negotiate the hypervisuality of everyday life in a digitized global culture, who are at all times in danger of being undercut by transnational capital, end quote, that produces and reproduces a patriarchal, Eurocentric, and heterosexual normativity. Visuality itself is understood as the intersection of power with visual representation. Feminism and visual culture mutually inform each other. Feminism, by demanding an understanding of how gender and sexual difference figure in cultural dynamics coextensively with other modes of subjectivity and subjection, such as sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, and class, among others, has figured prominently in the strengths of visual culture analysis. And in turn, quote, feminism has long acknowledged that visuality, the conditions of how we see and make meaning of what we see, is one of the key modes by which gender is culturally inscribed in Western culture, end quote. In particular, the development of the notion of the male gaze has been of great theoretical and historical significance to engage with the conventions of representation of women and sexual difference in visual culture. John Berger and Laura Mulvey gave, gave feminist depth in the critical discourse of how women are represented in visual culture while simultaneously emphasizing the importance of visual analysis for a feminist theory of culture. They show that visual images not only orchestrate and reiterate patriarchal power relations, but bear these relations within their formal structure and enduring conditions of production, distribution, and reception. Through an analysis of the tradition of the nude in European oil painting, Berger proposes the notion of the male gaze. He invokes Clark's opposition between nakedness and nudity, wherein naked is to be without clothes and nude is a form of art or genre that derives its conventions of representation from an art historical tradition. Accordingly, to be naked is to be oneself, reveals itself, and is without disguise, as opposed to being nude where a woman becomes a display aware of being seen by a spectator whose gaze remakes her nakedness into nudity as a form of dress that makes her unrecognizable to herself. For Berger, quote, nakedness is not an expression of her own feelings, end quote, but rather a sign of her submission to the male gaze or the owner's feelings and demands. As a result, in the genre of the nude, the principal protagonist is presumed to be a man, a stranger with his clothes still on, that is never painted and remains outside the frame, but without ever releasing the authority to frame, own, and reconstruct women's nakedness into nudes. The power lies in what remains invisible outside the frame. Berger contends that the exceptions to the nude are paintings of loved women that break the norms of the art form. We can see this in his discussion of the Allegory of Time and Love by Bronzino, uh, circa 1545, which he contrasts to Rubens' painting of his second wife, uh, uh, Hélène Fourment, 
uh, the little fur coat, circa 1636-38. In Bronzino's painting, Venus is kissed by Cupid, but the frontal positioning of her body, typical of post-Renaissance European sexual imagery, is arranged to display it to the man, spectator, owner that looks at the picture and to appeal to his sexuality, having nothing to do with her own sexuality. Berger claims that Rubens' painting, however, displays a painter's, um, sorry, this is uh, uh, Rubens. Berger claims that Rubens' painting, however, displays a painter's personal vision of a particular woman in such a powerful way that it makes no allowance for the spectator, who must recognize himself as an outsider, and thus there is nakedness rather than nudity. Nudity is for the voyeur, while nakedness is for the lover. Although in modern times the nude as an art genre has become less important, Berger contends that the male gaze's structuring force in how women are represented has not changed. Despite Berger's insights, I believe that his interpretation of nakedness is implicitly based upon essentialist premises of a quote-unquote real fem female sexual and gender identity that can exist outside systems of representation. I see the relation of newness to nakedness as a relation of continuity rather than discontinuity, especially as it refers to Rubens' painting where his wife's sexuality and body are visually instrumentalized by his subjectivity and desire. Despite their differences, the works by Broncino and Rubens can alternatively be viewed as variations on the nude instead of diametrical opposites. This does not have to mean that nakedness as an alternative to the male gaze is an impossibility but rather that it too is mediated by the practices of signification and relations of power. Laura Mulvey develops this thread of analysis further by using psychoanalysis to develop the concept of the male gaze in classic Hollywood movies. As possibly the most highly cited work in, of feminist film scholarship, it theorized the role and production of desire between the image of a woman and the man that gazes upon her image. Mulvey's project is to appropriate psychoanalysis as a political weapon to demonstrate the way the unconscious of political society has structured film form. Mulvey interrogates how the patriarchal premises play out in tying woman, quote, to her place as bearer of meaning, not maker of meaning, end quote, and as a passive object of the active male gaze. The male gaze projects its fantasy onto the female figure, which is styled accordingly. What is of particular interest in Mulvey's thinking is that despite the objectified portrayal of woman posed by the controlling male gaze, the male viewer still feels threatened. These images fail to contain the male psychoanalytic threat of castration, and thus the representation of woman always threatens to evoke the anxiety of the original trauma. Given men's incapacity to solve their castration anxiety consciously, they must negotiate with their fear through two alternative unconscious mechanisms, namely the sadistic, that of the sadistic voyeur or fetishistic scopophilia. The sadistic voyeur delves into his trauma by demystifying and devaluing the guilty woman's mystery through either saving or punishing her. Uh, the unconscious root of fetishistic scopophilia, on the other hand, transmutes the menacing, fi menacing figure, female figure, into a reassuring and comforting fetish by shoring up, quote, the physical beauty of the object, transforming it into something satisfying in itself, end quote. The works of Berger and Mulvey raise difficult questions regarding the challenges to create representations of women that resist replicating male heterosexual desire and the male gaze, questions that are further complicated and enriched by studies on post-colonialism and technology. Uh, the next session is the technocoloniality of vision. For Maria Fernandez, the perspective of postcolonial studies is in general sorely missing from electronic media studies since they, quote, developed parallel to one another but with very few points of intersection, end quote. Part of the problem lay in the sanitized appropriation of Haraway's theories whereby her cyber utopian hybrid cyborg was uh, selectively emphasized at the expense of her attempts to incorporate post-colonial or so-called third world feminism, which were mostly ignored. 
Post-colonial studies and the notion of coloniality of power name the process whereby, despite the successes of colonized territories in their struggles for independence, racial, ethnic, sexual, gendered, and class forms of colonial domination con continued to be reenacted within the frames of the newly formed nation states. While classic imperial colonization normally refers to a wide-ranging direct domination of territories by a central power, theories on coloniality of power and post-colonialism signal the subtle and not so subtle continuities of colonial hierarchies and discourses despite the formal eradication of colonialism. In this way, coloniality of power can exist without a colonial administration or independence can exist without decolonization. Material relations of domination are thus incomprehensible outside of their inscription in the social imaginary of domination, the images and discourses power deploys in the contested terrains of inequality. Fernandez sees the erasure of the body in electronic media studies as symptomatic of the failure to effectively integrate post-colonial interrogations. Although in the late 1980s electronic media theory concentrated on the preeminence of the virtual body, by the late 1990s the body had become altogether irrelevant. Examples are the de-radicalized appropriation of Haraway's cyborg, uh, as mentioned, and Sherry Turkle's proposal of individual identity as a ludic play among virtual versions of documents on shifting screens. These liberational imaginations, according to Chela Sandoval, fail to account for the myriad women oppressed under capitalist conditions of repetitive labor that, quote, know the pain of the union of machine and bodily tissue, end quote, but without any of the social benefits and legal rights to protect them. Contrary to electronic media's virtualization and invisibilization of the body, uh, electronic media's theory, uh, Fernandez contends that post-colonial, and I'm quoting here, post-colonial studies underscore the physiological specificity of the lived body as the realities of subjection are inscribed on the bodies of colonized peoples torture, rape, and physical exhaustion, as well as the learning of a new bodily grammars uh, and forms of discipline required by colonization and conversion." End quote. Furthermore, the severance of the construction of identity from bodily experience in electronic media is a severance from history. Electronic media theory has led to a banalization of history or to a recombinant history, where digitization, archiving, and sample enable the conversion of local histories into virtualized games and fantasy worlds that play into the, quote, entertainment function for the comfort zone taste of the virtual classes, end quote. According to Lisa Nakamura, the dangerous of this kind of identity tourism is that it, quote, takes this restriction across the axes of race class in the real world to an even more subtle and complex degree by re reducing non-white identity positions to part of a costume or masquerade to be used by curious vacationers in cyberspace. The paradigm of Asian passing masquerades uh, works to suppress racial difference by setting the tone of the discourse in racist contours, which inevitably discourage real-life Asian men and women from textual performance in that space, effectively driving race underground. As a result, a default whiteness covers the entire social space and race is whited out in the name of cyber-social hygiene." End quote. These recent these re-semantizations mark what Aparicio and Chavez Silverman call hegemonic tropicalizations, whereby minority symbols or cultural productions are mainstreamed within, quote, more normative and dominant values that make them attractive to a dominant public whose reception reaffirms its dominance over minority cultures. This whole gamut of themes suggests cultural integration, yet also transforms them into objects of consumption rather than social and cultural practices." End quote. 
I will use the term technocoloniality of vision to bring together the post-colonial critiques of technology studies, the notion of the male gaze and rape culture in order to grapple with the intersectional coexistence of forms of oppression experienced by female othered bodies steeped in the histories of colonial domination and exploitation. The next section is uh, feminist aesthetic, what can it be? How can artistic activist interventions engage in a feminist aesthetic that undermines the technocoloniality of vision or the male gaze of empire? For starters, in order to mobilize a feminist framework in art, it must both problematize the criteria for assigning aesthetic value to art and the measures for cataloging works into series called histories of art. Linda Noglin wonderfully explores these questions when she kickstarted Western feminist art history in 1979 with the insightfully uncomfortable question of why have there been no great women artists? For Noglin, the question insidiously supplies its own answer, basically, quote, that women are incapable of greatness. It demonstrates that inability of human beings with rooms rather than penises to create anything significant, end quote. Nochlin criticizes feminist reactions that assert the existence of a distinctive feminine aesthetic inspired on the specificity of female experience, distinct in its formal and expressive qualities because it assumes that there is an underlying essence of femininity that can link the styles of women artists generally, and as Nellie Richard adds, it expresses woman as a natural essential and not as a symbolic discursive category formed and deformed by systems of cultural representation. Moreover, simply adding new materials such as women and their history to existing categories and methods in art history does not alter the systematicity of the rationale responsible for marginalizing the feminine from its field of masculine self-referentiality. Contrary to a feminine aesthetic, when does the work of an artist propose a feminist aesthetic? According to Richard, a feminist aesthetic postulates woman as a sign immersed in a chain of patriarchal forms of oppression and repression, and seeks to correct the stereotypical images of the feminine that the hegemonic masculine has demeaned. It is an art that intervenes in visual culture from the understanding of how codes of identity and power structure the representation of sexual difference, end quote. It is an exercise that can disorganize the cultural messages that totalize the masculine perspective as an absolute vantage point and can invoke the materialist conception of an art as a practice of signs inserted into the antagonistic and confrontational plots of the social. Similarly, feminist subaltern perspectives can invoke the coexistence of a plurality, plur, plurality of times, colonial and post-colonial, that, quote, create a disjunction, a time lag, that renders the project of modernity contradictory and unresolved, and provide a basis for the representation of subaltern and post-colonial agency, since it introduces an alternative site for intercession or another locus of inscription and intervention, another hybrid, inappropriate enunciative site through that temporal split or time lag. End quote. A feminist aesthetic that engages the technocoloniality of the male gaze must grapple, in one way or another, with the semiotic histories of racialization and hypersexualization of the continually uh, recolonized body of the female other. This can be particularly difficult in the context of art that explores sexually explicit uh, speech. Okay, I'm looking at the time. Uh, the next section is anti-pornography and rape culture. Are misinterpretations inevitable? In a similar vein to the above discussion, Jane Bailey explain, uh, explores how a fundamental dilemma for pornography is, quote, whether it is possible to transform pornography and its meanings by reshaping it in a manner that converts the aspects of mainstream pornography that constrain the identity woman with stereotype presumptions of sexually constructed, not only in relation 
with sex, sorry, with uh, presumptions of sexuality constructed not only in relation to gender, but to interlocking axes of discrimination such as race, end quote. Sexually explicit activist art is at the crux of this dilemma. Some of the feminists that contend pornography should be censured include, despite important differences, Catherine McKinnon and critical race scholars Marie Matsuma and Kimberly Crenshaw. Their arguments center on how pornography causes harm to disadvantaged groups. For McKinnon, pornography is not a matter of free speech, but rather of discrimination that structures the unequal relationship between men and women. Pornography becomes the essence of the subordination of women and the primary mechanism for sculpting sexuality. All pornography is thus the documentation of rape. Sexuality is understood as the primary mechanism for gender oppression, which produces the appearance of gender as reified and pre-social. Crenshaw looks not just uh, looks at not just gender, but other axes of subordination such as race and class in order to understand the intersectional violence embedded in representations of black and Latina women. She quote a quote. Uh, cultural representations of women of color as vulgar and promiscuous monsters or as pathetic victims reify stereotypes, incite violence, and trivialize accounts of harm by victims. Representational intersectionality can thus harm women." End quote. Pornography for Crenshaw wounds black women because it reifies tropes of black women as promiscuous and sex-crazed. Pornography just confirms black women's nature. In a similar vein, Matsuda addresses the power of hate speech to wound just as it can pornography. Quote, even without physical action, words do things to people. Hate speech derogates, demeans, and dehumanizes the individual to whom it is directed. Like pornographic images, the words not only proclaim the individual's inferiority, but also have the power to construct them as such. So uh, part of the critique to uh, McKinnon uh, has to do with the lack of female agency in, in her conception of women as not having a voice. Um, and this ties into some of the critiques also that have been addressed uh, to uh, rape culture, uh, uh, sort of infantilizing uh, uh, women in terms of their uh, agency. Um, so that, that's one area that, that I'm developing also. Uh, these leftist feminist critiques of pornography uh, do not accept uh, traditional First Amendment doctrines that protect much pornography and hate speech in the United States. The legal regulation of pornography under the First Amendment frames it as, quote, as a question of the freedom of expression of the pornographers and their consumers, uh, rendering it in terms of content, message, emotion, ideas, and viewpoint. Uh, by treating pornography as defamation rather than discrimination, quote, mean is con uh, meaning is conceived in terms of what it says rather than what it does. The worst pornography can do under this conception is offend. Amy Adler's main concern is how this discourse can endanger, uh, quote, endanger a great deal of activist speech, particularly in the form of artwork that in fact seeks to undermine the very pornography and hate speech the censorship advocate, uh, advocates target. End quote. She worries that because much postmodern art appropriates the language and images of hate speech and pornography in order to deconstruct or otherwise subvert them, leftist attempts at censorship carry a grave danger of silence, silencing leftist activists. Adler maintains that the problem lies in the theory of interpretation of anti-pornography leftist thinkers, referring to their inability to grapple with the radical implications of the indeterminacy of language. So here Adler enters in a whole analysis of sort of the semiotic uh, legacy and post-structuralist analysis of language, that, that there is no meaning that is essentially contained within an image or a word or an event, but that meaning is uh, constructed within uh, uh, signification systems and uh, processes of reception, appropriation, etc. Um, 
So uh, let's look at some of the artworks by feminist artists that have actively explored sexual, gendered, and racial violence against women and can help contextualize our discussion of Emma's work. It's almost obligatory to mention early performance works by Yoko Ono, uh, Maria Abramovic, and Anna Mendieta, as well as some performance interventions of the 1980s by Karen Finley and Annie Sprinkle. In cut piece, Yoko Ono sat on, sat on a stage and invited people from the audience to cut pieces of cloth from her dress. While the cutting was done timidly at first, the cutting escalated when a member of the audience cut one of her bra straps. The piece calls women's sexual objectification into question and use, quote, the female body as a medium for art and protest. The role of the spectator was crucial in constructing the meaning of the performance. Although there have been many conflicting interpretation about Ono's performance, her motionless and her motionlessness and passivity waiting for the spectators to intervene have raised questions about vulnerability and consent as well as the traditional role of women as docile. Rhythm Zero is the last piece of the series Rhythm by Marina Abramovic. In the six-hour performance art, she stood still at the center of the gallery. The instructions posted on the wall were, there are 72 top objects on the table that one can use on me as desired. Performance, I am the object. During this period, I take full responsibility. End quote. Among the objects at the table were a rose, a book, a perfume, an axe, a knife, and a gun without one bullet. The first few hours of the performance went smoothly. She received from the audience a rose, a hug, and a kiss. After that, cordiality ended. The audience actions became more violent through the passage of time. They cut her and drunk her blood. They tied her up and cut her cloth off, leaving her naked. They even took the gun with a bullet and gave it to her to promote uh, some form of assist, uh, attempted suicide. She emerged from the project alive, but not without physical injuries and lasting scars at the hands of her audience. As Marina states, the public can kill you. This is what I wanted to see. Untitled Rape Scene is a color photograph of the artist Ana Mendieta stripped from the waist down and bent over a table. Blood is smeared over and drips down her buttocks, thighs, and cuffs. The photograph is the documentation of an action that the artist performed in her apartment in Iowa City while she was a student at the University of Iowa. The performance was in response to a brutal and highly publicized rape and murder of a nursing student. The following month, Mendieta invited her fellow students to her apartment where, through a door left purposefully ajar, they found her in the position recorded in this photograph, which recreated the scene as reported by the press. In the 1980s, Karen Finley, one of the most famous feminist performance artists, portrays sexual violence in disturbing ways that, for instance, invoke a rapist's point of view, as in her piece, I'm an Ass Man, or by using profane language and defiling her own body. Annie Sprinkle, described as a prostitute and porn star turned sex educator and performance artist in her performance, public cervix announcement, invites the audience to, quote, celebrate the female body, end quote, by viewing her cervix with a speculum and flashlight. Sprinkle explores the tension between her use of the conventions of representation of a porn setting combined with a medical self-gynecological examination. In this performance, Sprinkle engages the prototypical male sexist gaze of pornography that, however, is disrupted, confused, and destabilized by the medical examination she performs upon herself. The anatomical medical display of her inner body disrupts the male fantasy of traditional pornography.
Couple in a Cage, Tour Amerindians Visit the West is a 1992-93 performance artwork by Guillermo Gomez Peña and Coco Fusco. The work made visible the history of abuse, captivity, and exploitation in the aftermath of the colonial encounter, drawing heavily on the history of colonial exhibitions. They presented themselves as previously undiscovered Amerindians from the fictional uncolonized island of Guatinao. Aided by the students of the University of California, the, the artist erected a cage and filled it with a ghetto blaster, candles, Polaroid camera, and film, bedpans, ritual artifacts, spray paint, body paint, etc. Um, so what's interesting here is uh, um, that they also did uh, uh, sexual performances. The, the viewers could pay to see the genitalia of uh, the male uh, native and uh, the woman performed dances, etc. The performance was a play uh, on the notion of authenticity of the native that made subversive appropriations of tropicalized, tropicalized stereotypes with deep roots in colonial and imperial histories, such as colonial exhibitions. Its confusing and discomforting hybridizations destabilize the perspective of, of the imperial gaze of otherness as a state of authenticity trapped in a timeless and unchanging past. But their performance was in fact, above all, a way to document the reactions of the public. The performance is harsh to watch due to the widespread acceptance of colonial forms of representing other in displays of caged people as part of the colonial exhibitions. So the, their varied reaction, there's a wonderful film uh, 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 which uh, Coco Fusco co-directs with another person, uh, but it's actually very hard to watch to, just to see how acceptable <laughs> uh, and how many people actually believe they were, they were actual natives uh, uh, in, in, in the cage. So... Um, the next section, uh, now we turn to uh, Emma Sulkowitz, This Is Not a Rape. With this background, now let's turn to Emma's work, This Is Not a Rape. What follows is still very much a work in progress, and I will divide it into what I will call points dilemmas. So I'm just going to go from point dilemma, point dilemma, as part of my uh, uh, process. Point dilemma. A critical discussion that must be made is between works that make an instrumental use of digital technologies merely as a tool of production, as opposed to work such as Emma's that engages self-reflexively with said technologies. The instrumentalist approach does not unravel the traditional conception of an artwork as a finite object. Uh, such as a sculpture, print, photograph, whereas the self-consciously digital artwork quote, that employs these technologies as a tool for the creation of a less material software-based form that utilizes the digital medium's inherent characteristics, such as its participatory and generative features, end quote. Contrary to the traditional notion of an artwork that is seen as a linear and finished work, Emma's digital performance art is, quote, time-based, dynamic, and non-linear, end quote. Her digital artwork might not be repeat repeatable or could reconfigure itself continuously. This makes the contextual understanding of a digital artwork more layered to the extent that it relates to the materiality of the artwork and the computational processes that transcend the work itself. Digital art in this way does not refer to an essentialist, ontological, phenomenological understanding of the digital, but instead refers to, quote, social forms that involved electronic and digital communications technologies, such as different types of collaboration that transcend specific pieces of hard and software. Digital art is an umbrella to name art that is predominantly understood as digital-born, computable art that is created, stored, and distributed via digital technologies and uses the features of these technologies as a medium. Point Dilemma. Part of the performative proposal of the work involves her use of the technology itself. The standalone website opens with trigger warnings, caveats, explanations, and questions through which the viewer scrolls down in order to reach the video, which must be clicked to 
be seen. And below the video lies the public commentary, which as of this weekend, I already mentioned, had 5,413 posts. In her trigger warning, Emma clarifies that her work is not a reenactment of her rape. Quote, the following text contains allusions to rape. Everything that takes place in the following video is consensual, but may resemble rape. It is not a reenactment, but may seem like one. If at any point you are triggered or upset, please proceed with caution and or exit this website. However, I do not mean to, pre to be prescriptive, for many people find pleasure in feeling upset, end quote. She goes on to state that this is not a rape, it's not about one night in August 2012. Quote, it's about your decision starting now. It's only a reenactment if you disregard my words. It's about you, not him, end quote. In a clear reference to uh, Susi Nebaz Un Peep from René Magritte's The Treachery of Images, Emma raises the semiotic critique of the collapse between an act and its representation. But more importantly, she is putting the viewers and their reactions in the spotlight. It is a participatory artwork where the online response in the comments section is a central part of the work. She cautions not to watch the video, the video quote, if your motives would upset me, my desires are unclear to you or my nuances are undecipherable, end quote. Uh, you might be uh, uh, continuing quote. Sorry, you might be wondering why I've made myself this vulnerable. Look, I want to change the world, and that begins with you seeing yourself. If you watch this video without my consent, then I hope you reflect on your reasons for objectifying me and participating in my rape. In that case, you were the one who couldn't resist the urge to make Susi ne pas en viol about what you wanted it wanted to make it about rape. Please, don't participate in my rape. Watch kindly." End quote. The act of viewing in an unkind way that replicates the premises of rape culture and the availability of the female body to satisfy male desire is tantamount to rape or at the very least complicity in its conditions of possibility. All of us are potentially rapists if we do not engage self-reflexively in the experience of watching the video. Emma throws down the gauntlet with some questions to frame the experience. Searching. Are you searching for proof? Proof of what? Are you searching for ways to either hurt or help me? What are you looking for? Desiring. Do you desire pleasure? Do you desire revulsion? Is this to counteract your unconscious enjoyment? What do you want from this experience? Me. How well do you think you know me? Have you ever met me? Do you think I'm the perfect victim or the world's worst victim? Do you refuse to see me as either a human being or a victim? If so, why? Is it to deny me agency and thus further victimize me? If so, what do you think of the fact that you owe your ability to do so to me? Since I'm the one who took a risk and made myself vulnerable in the first place. Do you hate me? If so, how does it feel to hate me?" End quote. The technological design forces viewers, to some degree or another, to engage with Emma's contextualization of the video. Her process of discursive reinscription through the visual layout and composition of the website destabilizes the male gaze in its journey to reach the video. For Emma, the video is not a documentation of her rape, but an opportunity to engage with the social imaginary of a violent society. Similar to Ono, Abramovic, Gomez Peña, and Fusco, her work also is a document of the spectators. Despite the parallelisms to other works, such as Couple in a, in a Cage, the viewers in that performance were unaware that their reactions were the actual purpose of the performance and were being documented via video interviews that were later put together in a film. In Emma's work, she gives viewers notice and frames the whole experience with her trigger warning, introductory paragraphs, and interpretive challenges. Interestingly, it is not clear when the trigger warning ends and the interpretive gauntlet is thrown down. Trigger warnings are designed to protect sensitivities to particularly harsh materials, which is what Emma, Emma does when she states, if at any point you are triggered or upset, please proceed with caution and or exit this website. 
However, in the next sentence, she expresses her unwillingness to be entirely prescriptive given that some people enjoy being upset. And from there on, she is openly challenging hostile viewers to question themselves and their motives in viewing the work. Thus, although trigger warnings generally serve to protect sensitivities, her trigger warning interestingly becomes a trigger warning for the insensitive, challenging them to be sensitive and kind. She exposes herself to being wounded and re-victimized as a performative confrontation. Emma assumes the inevitability of misinterpretation of the technocoloniality of vision and, is a and designed a way to display the viscera of racism and sexism in the interpretations of her work. Although she does not control interpretation, she engages with its violence in a technical architecture that almost forces hostile viewers to confront her counter-narrative before accessing the video. Point Dilemma. A particularly painful aspect of watching Emma's video is the banality of rape, how rape seems to happen seamlessly, moving from a consensual to a non-consensual encounter, almost imperceptibly, after which the white aggressor leaves the room, she goes to the bathroom and bathes and later returns to bed to slide under the covers. The work perturbingly evokes the ubiquity of rape culture and how it normalizes violence against women. The work, similar to Couple in a Cage, also evokes the banality of coloniality. Both speak to the intersectional continuities of oppression, racial, sexual, and otherwise, but also to their entrenched invisibility, normalization, and acceptability. Point dilemma. Does Emma interrogate the boundaries between art and obscenity in ways that destabilize patriarchal representations of the female body? Does Emma break down the visual economy of rape culture and coloniality of the male gaze? Does she shatter the visual economy of the female body as destined exclusively for masculine pleasure? A discussion of Jenny Cam can help pinpoint important differences relative to Emma's performance. In her analysis of the Jenny Cam phenomenon, Bailey shows, on the one hand, certain transgressive strands of the project, such as the display of the non-epic nor sexualized everyday life of Jenny Ringley. But on the other hand, we also witness the progressive commercialization of the space and her increasingly sexually stereotyped performances. This is compounded by the selective decontextualization of her work through viewers' appropriation of the sexually explicit parts of the transmission to create videos that resembled more directly the conventions of traditional pornography. <laughs> Although one can say that Emma's eight-minute video of a rape can be more easily appropriated as mainstream pornography than the Jenny Cam project with its long-term documentation of the intimate life of a young woman in her private sphere, the question is whether Emma's intervention is a more transgressive feminist intervention in the, in the mind fields of the dominant modes of seeing. Does she nevertheless mobilize a more disquieting feminist aesthetic than Jenny Cam, despite the impossibility of clearly drawing a line between her video and traditional uh, pornography? Whereas Jenny Cam progressively fulfilled the stereotypes of femininity and commercialization of the female body, Emma's work terrorizes the experience through her contextualization of the work as a document of the cultural anxieties of the viewer's social imaginary as graphically displayed in the comment section of the work. Where does the real pornography lie? In the video or in the graphic materialization of the viewer's violence, racism, and misogyny? Emma displaces gaze from her hypersexualized and racialized body to a pornographic display of the inner workings of the cultural banality of rape and coloniality. Emma does not want to be framed by the male gaze and is attempting to redraw the lines of the visual economy of interpretation. She destabilizes the subject position of the viewer in relation to its object that instead of remaining passive, talks back disrespectfully to the violent viewer and disorganizes the structure of his supremacy. 
Furthermore, another difference with Jenny Cam is how Emma's performative work assumes technology as an architecture of power that gathers full force in the video surveillance aesthetic to portray acts of sexual violence towards a racialized minority. In contrast, Jenny Cam's intervention assumes a more naive conception of technology as enabling a neutral and transparent access to the quote unquote real life of a white young woman. Point dilemma. Can there be a feminist aesthetic that represents a total break with the techno-coloniality of the male gaze and its interpretive coordinates within visual culture? Can there be Berger's sense of nakedness as a complete rupture with the male gaze? Although I believe that there is no entirely safe and sanitized way to embody coloniality and rape culture as played out on women's bodies, we can rethink uh, Berger's opposition between nudity and nakedness from the perspective of a feminist aesthetic and propose nakedness as a feminist strategy to displace the male gaze from its comfort zone into a space of self reflexive unsustainability rather than as an essentialist representation of female authenticity outside the male gaze. A feminist nakedness would be an eruption of visual discomfort in a minefield of hyper-racialized and sexualized visual iconographies. There may be no underlying truth to nakedness, but rather the possibility of a feminist aesthetic that undermines the normative gaze. Despite the interpretive pornification of her gesture by the male gaze that tries to tropicalize or neutralize the strength of her critique, Emma's work interrupts the male gaze by evoking its obscenity. The more she displays her body, the more unreadable she becomes, and the more visible the male gaze becomes in its compulsive efforts to resituate her within an amenable reading of the subjugated body that invites rape. In Mulvey's terms, we can say that her body is not the bearer of patriarchal meaning, but a maker of meaning, Emma inverts the gaze of the peephole to interrogate the technocoloniality of the sadistic voyeur. Emma's artistic intervention resists the comfortable comfortable refashioning of identities or identity tourism through stereotyped appropriations to invoke the multiple temporalities and time lags of the colonial encounter as inscripted on her surveilled, raped, and racialized body. Her work is an inappropriate enunciative site from which the subaltern can speak in tongues to unravel and reveal the contradictions of the project of modernity. Point Dilemma. Part of the art-related historiographical question of stigmatizing or devaluing sexually explicit works by women involves the question if whether we are replicating the masculine criteria of assigning value to what are considered great works of art produced by great artists. By disqualifying these works, are we aligned with the hegemony of guidelines fixed by the masculine discursivity of official culture? Are we supporting a formalist category of quality that is part and parcel of the prejudicial culture culture of masculine supremacy in the arts. By rephrasing Nolan's question, why have there been why have there not been any sexually explicit great women artists? I am concerned whether anti-pornography feminisms operate to undercut the transgressive contributions of these works given their performative ambiguity in relation to patriarchal uh, discourses. Women artists oh that was supposed to go with Jenny Kim. So, women artists ha were historically denied the study of the nude as part of their professional training. Uh, so here we have an image of women uh, who uh, were uh, modeling a cow because they couldn't have access to the nude as part of their uh, uh, art artistic training. Um, and uh, here is an image, uh, there is a portrait of a woman uh, on the wall, and she was a student, but she couldn't be there because there was a nude male model, so they put her portrait there so she could witness vicariously through her portrait what was going on. Um, so does the censorship of controversial sexually explicit works pose a strange reenactment of the notion of sexual propriety for a female artist who can now study a nude model as part of her education but not embody more transgressive forms of sexual explicitness in her work? The censorship of sexually explicit works by female artists can once again deny women their bodies as spaces of representation that inscript the everyday violences of misogyny, racism, and classism. 
Is it not precisely because the work is borderline that it is able to repoliticize questions about the female body in its intersectional oppressions? I believe that work such as that of Emma propose a feminist aesthetic of oppositional ambiguity that destabilizes the violence of dominant structures of inequality. Emma powerfully repol repoliticizes the female nude to question the histories of sexual objectification and racialization of the other bodies of empire. Moreover, the bad quality of the video, its quotidian, documentary, and multi-angle surveillance aesthetic questions the exclusionary aesthetics of a modernist masculine conception of excellence in art, meaning high art. This has resonance with Richard's analysis of a video by Chilean artist Diamela El Tit, where the bad image, in contrast to the technical hyper-control of experts in the visuality of consumption, was capable of creating a different aesthetic of imperfections and blunders as a symbolic homage to the failures of hegemonic narrations. Emma appropriates the bad image of the surveillance video and proposes an aesthetic of feminine errata that stands in a tense relationship with the male gaze's fantasy of control over the other female figure. Point Dilemma. As has been abundantly studied, surveillance technologies do not surveil all bodies equally. Emma's invocation of the surveillance aesthetic is very evocative of the desire to possess, know, propertize, and control the body of the female order. Other. Its use in the inner confines of the private space of her dorm room can invoke the omnipresent and ubiquitous surveillance of other people for whom there is radically less or no privacy at all relative to state and corporate powers. It also can make the personal political by virtue of its display on the website. She responds to this imperial poetics of surveillance with an uncomfortable counter narrative of rape and abuse. So um, I'm seeing that I don't have much time, uh, and uh, I, I have this. I became very interested in anti-surveillance art as part of uh, working on this, and so we have uh, these works by uh, Zach Blass, uh, Facial Weaponization Suite, Fat Face uh, Communique. Um, and we have uh, CB Dazzle by Adam Harvey, and uh, we have Hyperface. All of these have in common efforts to make uh, impossible the functioning of uh, surveillance technologies, such as biometric technologies, etc. And I had a detailed explanation, but I'll just go to my analysis. I have seven minutes. <laughs> So, uh, let me see if I'm going to be able to do that. Yes, I think maybe you'll, you'll give me the scary look if I, if I'm, I go. Okay. So I'm not going to, uh, I'll just put this. Historically, one of the most important contributions of feminism to the production of knowledge and social change has been the notion that the personal is political. Patriarchal structures created two separate spheres of symbolic action and production, namely the public sphere reserved for men in the exercise of their political, economic, and social power as opposed to the private sphere where women remain subordinated in their domestic and homemaking duties of wives and mothers. Feminism contends that democratic values must extend beyond the public sphere to private spaces and in the process politicize the personal. How does this tie into the paradigm shift to the network society marked by flows of information, capital, technology, and symbols, which are the expressions of processes dominated our economic, political, and symbolic life that has ultimately led to the social condition of ubiquitous computing? understood as the embedding of network sensing, calculating, and responsive machines through the spaces that alters both these architectures of visibility and the ability to negotiate the sense and meaning of spaces. That, that last part was a quote. The limitations of the traditional privacy model with its need divide between activities in private place as private and activities in a public place as public are particularly acute under the Aegis of ubiquitous computing and its complex processes of identity construction and surveillance. It is why Phillips contends that, quote, the question is not how to protect our privacy, it is how to be public, how to engage in public life, how to figure out one's situation, identity, and desires in community. People are engaged in a process of redefining boundaries that still remains to be understood in its full-fledged complexity.
In the context of ubiquitous computing and the related ambiguity over what constitutes privacy and public spaces, it would seem that all aspects of the personal can be commodified or surveilled in one way or another. The dilemma is how can women and girls inhabit spaces in ways that continue to transgress the public-private divide without being continually uh, surveilled and subject to the extraction of information. Anti-surveillance art is a dialogue with how to make the purposeful and inadvertent information leakages of the body unreadable, unproprietable, and undatable, or how to make surveillance technologies malfunction. Technology shroud art can be seen as a strategy of visual self-encryption to create mobile private spaces. Is the personal still political given the prevalence of ubiquitous computing and surveillance? The use of these digital proof anti-surveillance closets as a form of resistance raises the questions of whether the unpersonal has now become political, meaning the capacity to remain unreadable and intentionally confuse corporate state and other forms of data collection and surveillance. The challenge is how can women and girls avoid being commodified and surveilled without resorting to private spaces, a digital closet, or some form of female decorum or propriety. A regressive return to a womanhood of domestic privacy and invisibility would, in a sense, be parallel to reenacting the closed body of the idealized female figure of the male gaze as displayed through art history, remaining visually unreadable and untractable as proposed by anti-surveillance art can be a legitimate strategy for female bodies to also remain leaky and unholy. The feminist dilemma is how to remain visible while remaining digitally unreadable. Actively engaging in being technologically misread can be a form of female agency that defies ubiquitous technologies. Being unreadable is an act of defiance in our technologically saturated lives. In this way, anti-surveillance artistic interventions can be considered activist technologies of incommunication. As Zach Blas proposes, sexual, racial, and other forms of visual encryption through anti-surveillance activist art can universalize queerness. By universally techno-queering everyone, we all become suspect and the system's functionality is unraveled. More importantly, I believe that hidden the hidden or confusing body of counter-surveillance art also represents a resistance to the very centrality of vision in Western history and the strictures of the techno-coloniality of its visual culture. So I'll read the last, uh, the reason I brought it all together. So some final remarks. What is the difference between sexually explicit art and anti-surveillance artistic interventions? Etymologically, to be obscene is to be off stage. What is obscene now? This, this, that which cannot be transmuted into digital data into an exchangeable and redistributable universal common denominator. denominator. Now to be obscene is to be unreadable and to actively engage in misreadings. The human gaze itself is a social technology of misinterpretations that dehumanizes, violently misreads, and tropicalizes other people, particularly women and their bodies, in ways that situate them as pathologized, racialized, and or hypersexualized. This technocoloniality of vision precedes surveillance technologies and informs their imagination. The technocoloniality of vision as an historically constituted form of violent misinterpretation of otherness is embedded even more dysfunctionally into the technologies of surveillance given their profound lack of interpretive nuance. We are all subject to interpretation within the signifying systems that mark our lives. The point here is not that there is a pure original body behind all its misreadings, but rather how to resist the technocoloniality of the male gaze, both pre-digital and digital, toward activist misreadings of the body. These art forms do not just speak truth to power, they also speak of the technical construction of truths to power. Sexually explicit and anti-surveillance activist art are two strategies to engage with the technocoloniality of the male gaze. Whereas sexually explicit works can displace the male gaze from its comfort zone, anti-surveillance artworks hack the inner functionality of surveillance technologies to make the body illegible or intentionally misinterpreted, each in their own way break or hack the dominant interpretive codes that regulate inequalities. Thank you.
Okay, we have uh, we have to be out of here by about ten two, so we have a few minutes for questions, and I'm going to let uh, Professor Joyce take her own questions. Um, this is sort of a comment and a question. I guess I thought it was really interesting what you we were talking about around Emma's art in the context she put around that video. Like, this is not pornography, but kind of question why you're interpreting it the way you're interpreting it. Um, and does violence come from the nature of pornography or from the way pornography is viewed? So are you saying that, like, um, I guess, is it normally both? both in the way pornography is viewed and inherently in what pornography is, and is that a problem um, in all feminist art of depictions of bodies, is that it's not interpreted for, from the view of the artist, but from a misogynistic lens? Yeah, I guess uh, part of uh, the problem is where does uh, the process of signification occur? Is it contained within uh, the representation, the video, et cetera, or is it uh, a more complex process of uh, appropriations, interpretations, that and you can't really control it. So what's interesting for me in her work is that if you, if you decontextualize it from the, uh, the, the, the digital performance, you know, the digital art online, and you just take the video it, and, and you don't have her sort of terrorizing introductions that sort of force and engage the 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 the, the uh, audience, uh, then you could say that it is indistinguishable. But interestingly, once you place it in that frame, it becomes very. Uh, I, I I believe it is. Uh, very powerful in that way. But if it was just uh, simply, ambiguously uh, non-distinguishable, then maybe if you put it in a gallery, you change its context. No, uh, these works uh, evoke uh, the, an, a critical engagement because maybe the nature, mm -hmm. the context of the exhibition, you know, which is a critical feminist uh, discussion, etc. So that it, that's where you see the sort of liminal space that these artworks occupy. Do you want to take two minutes and, and talk a little bit about the anti-surveillance stuff? What what is the technology that you're that you're demonstrating for us? What does it do? What's what's a hyperface? Okay, I have them here. So. Uh, this one in particular is really interesting. Uh, it's called Facial Weaponization Suite, and it's uh, an artistic project of masks that are made in community-based workshops. Uh, and basically they're uh, questioning biometric facial recognition uh, uh, and governmentalities of the face. So uh, they each max is produced by aggregating the biometric facial data of participants in a given workshop, which results in an amorphous collective mask that allows participants to simultaneously wear the faces of many. In fact, the masks are only a success when they fail to be recognized as faces at all by facial recognition <laughs> technologies. Um, and then the, this is the CV Dazzle, uh, is a type of camouflage from computer vision. It uses bold patterning to break apart the expected features targeted by computer vision algorithms. Uh, it, it, it alters light and dark areas of the face according to vulnerabilities of specific computer vision Algorithm, so it targets a specific algorithm. And hyperface camouflage uh, is a series of pattern textiles designed to confuse specific facial uh, recognition algorithms. It's a new kind of camouflage that aims to reduce the confidence score of facial detection and recognition by providing false faces that uh, distract computer vision algorithms using fashion and cosmetics, etc. Uh -huh. I guess one of the things that 
that these kind of technologies make me think a lot about. Um, and it kind of, I think in a way, it links to Nakamura's critiques. But it's this idea that um, are we, again, it's the, you know, it's the question of are we adapting to technology or should technology be adapting to us? So, so, so if I'm sort of engaged in these projects that are sort of part of resistance, am I, am I somehow accepting that I don't, I can't travel, I, I'm, I can't travel through space um, the way I am. Uh, so that's the tension I always feel with these things. They, they, they. On the one hand, they're really interesting. On the other hand, um, are they actually just? Is it like throwing your hands up and saying, "Well, you know, this is this is how it's going to be. So let's see if we can trick the machine, mm -hmm. and then how long before the machine can decode that and recognize the face?" Right? It's just it's like that arm. It's a technology arms race. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think, so thinking about it in that context, I wonder if that concern also applies to projects like like Emma's or, I mean, Jenny Kim was an, an obvious one because she didn't take any measures to disable viewers' capacity to, 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 to take video and decontextualize it. Um, but again, it's like it's that technol—it's that technological arms race thing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if there's a question here. I just... No, I, I I agree with you. I mean, it's it the existence of the projects is fascinating. Uh, in terms of like strategies of artistic resistance, but the assumption is that we live in a hostile envir environment that is constantly, you know, uh, uh, vi violating us in different ways, uh, tracking us, uh, identifying us. Uh, so I agree with you. I mean, substantively, uh, it it doesn't address the underlying problem that we can't uh, be in these spaces without being harassed invisibly all the time. We don't even know how many cameras and biometric uh, technologies are watching us. But on the other hand, I think it's really important, particularly for activists, actual activists that, you know, otherwise are going to go to jail, uh, like, you know, uh, um, the Occupy activists, activists in Puerto Rico. So all these laws that are being passed to avoid people using masks obviously are passed uh, specifically and used selectively uh, for people who are pro uh, 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 questioning these problems of power and the fact that we can't actually uh, be free in spaces without quote-unquote free. And yet they strangely have their history in addressing racism and hate in the Klan, right? That's a and that just that just speaks to that just speaks to you know so we have a criminal code provision that deals with covering your face during the commission of a crime, um, and, and so this it's it also speaks to the way that when law engages, um, how it can how it can turn it to be repurposed and right it and becomes a pretext to oppress freedom of expression especially politically controversial freedom of expression. I'm going to interrupt now and say that we're, our time in this room is winding up, but I don't know about anybody else in this room, but I feel like for the next six weeks, all I'm going to think about is this presentation. <laughs> every time I go online, every time I think about my two girl children going online, every time I uh, engage with material that's sent to me online, um, it, it's, it's been incredibly um, sort of intellectually and from an activist perspective. Um, so gold mine your presentation, so thank, thank you very you. much. But it's also, I think, confronting and difficult. Um, so the great thing is, Professor Georges is with us as our in, uh, International Greenberg Scholar for the next little while. Um, so if you want to get in touch with her to talk to her about her research or your research that intersects with, uh, with hers, get in touch with me. I'm Angela Cameron. I'm a professor here at the Faculty of Law. You can find me on the website here. My picture is there, <laughs> uh, which, which now that we've heard this presentation suddenly means everything. Right? There's, there's a whole way we can go down to talk about um, what that means now that my picture's on the internet. Um, so. Get in touch with me, and I'll put you in touch with Professor Georges. But I, uh, I, I want to thank you very much for a, a very thought-provoking, interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you.